Um, welcome to this final session of the day, which is about a new approach to risk. And there's only us that stands between you and your, your drinks later. So, but we're going to keep you um, focused on a very interesting subject. And we developed this session to explore theory and practice around risk in the 25 years since the publication of De Ur is Human, which was the seminal report from the IHI in America about adverse events in hospitals and how to reduce them. And really, since that report was published, the whole context for considering risk in health care has fundamentally changed. Our ability to monitor and report on risk using routine data is transformed. Patient expectations of health care have changed. Both news and social media coverage of poor outcomes and safety breaches have changed and are reshaping public tolerance of risks. And with increased pressure on health services globally through a combination of ageing populations, growing demand, workforce shortages, financial pressures, staff are being asked to deliver more, generally for less, with inevitable implications for the inherent risks in service delivery. Indeed, in the last few days, there have been various media accounts of the pressures being faced by integrated care organisations and chief execs to deliver the A&E targets, to increase their surgical throughput, to discharge people faster. And the chief exec of the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly Integrated Care Board is quoted as saying that the risk aversion in decisions about discharging people directly to home is one of the factors hindering improvements. But there's no mention in that about how patients and carers would feel about a greater risk appetite in their service providers and whether that greater risk appetite would be trusted by them and whether they'd be willing, in consequence, to take on more risk themselves at home. So these are the kinds of things we want to think about. And this session is really rooted in a provocation that there is no such thing as absolute safety in healthcare, and that we may be actually creating adverse consequences by pursuing that goal. So we're going to start this session with some reflections from Professor Kevin Fong on the 25 years since To Err is Human was published. And this will be um, followed up by some reflections from Professor Joe Rafferty here, who is the CEO of Mersey Care, which is a mental health and community trust, and on how he's addressed risk, issues of risk within his trust. And we'll hear about their focus on creating a sense of psychological safety for staff uh, to explore and learn from errors. And then we're going to hear from Henrietta Hughes, who is a patient safety commissioner, about patient perspectives on risk and how to build trust and better communications. And then we'll open it up for comments and conversation with the audience. So, Kevin, thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to talk. Uh, so, I'm Kevin Fong. I'm a consultant in at University College London. Uh, I'm very interested in systems generally. Um, I've got a very strange CV that takes too long to explain. I, once upon a time, I accidentally did a degree in astrophysics and then, and then literally accidentally, and then went to med school and then went to work for NASA for a while. And at NASA, I realised they had the same problems that we had in that they were working with science, technology and engineering and risk to human life all in coinciding. And they had the same conversations in their coffee room that we did. And so I spent my life really looking around other organisations for lessons we could learn. So this talk is about risk and how we should approach it. And I want to take us back 25 years. The reason I wanted to talk about this is because To Err is Human, the Institute of Medicine seminal report, was uh, written in 1999, made publicly available in 2000, but it's 25 years since it was written. And really nothing has shaped the landscape of practice more than this document in modern times, I would argue. You can see there on the right the number of publications and grants awarded uh, as a function of time after its publication. And although patient safety was a movement beforehand, it really caught fire after this. Now, that opening page on the left there includes the statement that between about 50 and 100,000 patients die each year as a result of medical error. And it was this that shone a spotlight on the patient safety problem. For the next couple of decades then, this drove the following narrative, and it was, you know, it was pretty shocking. Uh, you can see there a Wall Street Journal from 2012 
how to stop hospitals from killing us. Uh, the Canadian Medical Society then equate the number of deaths occurring in terms of jumbo jets crashing into the ocean each week. And, and, and it's a scandal, it's a national scandal. You can see that timeline there that finishes in 2016, I think, with the statement that medical error becomes a leading cause of death. In fact, it is found in a BMG publication from 2016 to be the third most common cause of death. So this is our favorite story. The, the people who should be the good guys turn out to be the bad guys, and they're killing us in huge volumes. It's terrible, and we should do something about it. And indeed, this drives the tone of almost everything we do across most high-income countries. There's a problem, though. None of these numbers are true. None of them. Um, 251,000 deaths in hospitals per year. Someone then had the sense to ask, how many people die in American hospitals anyway? And the answer is about 750,000, which would mean that one in three people who die in American hospitals are killed by medical error. It doesn't sound right, does it? And it's because it isn't. This is a set of studies that makes the classic mistake of confusing correlation with causation. The studies themselves were never designed to find medical error as a cause of death. They found patients who'd experienced adverse events and then suffered death proximal to those events. So these are deaths proximal to error rather than deaths caused by error. If I asked you how you would decide whether or not someone had died as a result of a medical error, you would say, I would read the notes. And indeed, that's what people did. This is a slightly dense side, but it shows you two very useful papers. Some excellent work done by Helen Hogan at London, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she did what they should have done, which is retrospective case note review. Two blinded, uh, two blinded re reviewers trained specifically to go through the notes and look for indicators of adverse events that had contributed to death, grading it on a Likert scale. And if they co agreed with a correlation of more than 50%, that death was considered to have been likely contributed to by the event. Now, in the study I showed you in 2016, the putative rate is 33%. 33% of deaths in hospital are occurring as a, rate, as, as a result of medical error. 2016, that paper's out. Um, uh, when you do what Helen Hogan did, you get 3%, so an order of magnitude smaller. And indeed, on the right there, you've got um, Rodwin's paper, which is a meta-analysis of all the similar retrospective case note reviews from 2019, I think, um, which comes up with the same number, about 3%. But there's more than that. If you look at the demographics of the people who were involved in incidents where a medical error is considered to have uh, contributed to their death, two-thirds of those people are within the last three months of their life. Now, this is in no way to say that people who are near the end of their life are less important in terms of medical error. What it tells you is the truth of what we are dealing with, and which is why I wanted to talk about a recalibration of our attitudes towards medical risk, which is we are dealing with failure in complex systems. And that is, that is, that is difficult to do, and we don't give ourselves credit for it, and we don't communicate that very well often. Complex systems is not just a, a qualitative uh, description. Complexity theory has certain hard implications, and if not quite laws, it has certain rules uh, which you can't defy. If you're within a complex system, you cannot defy these rules any more than a stone thrown in the air can defy the laws of gravity. Now, these are five properties which are worth talking about. Complex systems are, as you all know, greater than the whole, a system in which the whole is greater than some of the parts. It's part of what makes our health systems work, and they're adaptable too. Um, this, I think, is mostly on our side, these properties. Uh, on the other side of that, you have non-linearity in your relationships, which means the, the causal relationship between cause and effect breaks down. So you no longer have, when you're trying to work out what just happened, it was Colonel Mustard in the dining room with the candlestick. That's not, that's not a story you can tell, even though we try really hard to do that. Uh, and finally, at the bottom there, you get uh, critical transitions. So it's partly what we're seeing, actually, in the climate at the moment. You, you reach a point after which nothing that you do is going to make much difference at all. And once you're at that point, you're in trouble. The problem is, in healthcare, it's very hard to know when you've reached that point and when you're dealing in that space rather than the space before it. In the blue in the middle there is a sort of intermediate 
not neither good nor bad uh, property of complex systems, which is the property of emergence. Emergence means stuff happens that you didn't expect to happen, and that can be good if it's your team adapting and creating something you didn't expect them to. And the fact that these systems operate on the edge of chaos. So a property of complex systems is that they self-organize this thing called self-organized criticality. They tend to they tend to organize themselves so they operate at the edge of chaos. That's not a bad thing. It means they're responsive and they're able to, uh, they're able to respond well to changes in the environment. Uh, on the other side of that is rigidity, and on the, on the, on the left of that is, is, is chaos. So, so that is roughly what you're dealing with when you work in everyday healthcare. What are the implications of this? Well, it means that we should see what, what you, it means is that we're working within systems that are trying to tear themselves apart perpetually, and the people within those systems tend to close the gap between reality and expectation there. So people are overwhelmingly assets rather than vulnerabilities. And so to err is human, the clues in the name, characterize the people within the system as a principal weakness, whereas actually the way we should think of those people as the most adaptable component of complex systems that are overwhelmingly the reason that things go right rather than the reason that things go wrong. The other side is, in a complex system, the concepts of root cause analysis, the idea that you can find a single root cause for whatever went wrong, is probably not useful. I would argue almost entirely not useful. And then there's the question of zero harm. Is it useful for us to be going for a goal of zero harm if zero harm isn't achievable? Because in the, 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 the pursuit of zero harm, is there also the, the risk of staff harm? If they can never achieve that goal within a system that is going to give you emergent failures that you cannot predict and cannot do anything about. Nevertheless, to err as humans, shone a spotlight on all of this and had some useful points. It did talk about the need to... Uh, uh, look at the healthcare system as a system and look at other high reliability, high risk organizations. Memorably, it compared us to uh, the airline industry and, and in one of the passages talks about how the great strides that the airline industry had made in improving safety over the years. And indeed, it is impressive. Even when you hear about recent incidents, these are the graphs. So from about the 1970s onwards on the left of that graph there, an exponential rise in the number of airline departures, an exponential fall in the number of fatalities. And so the question is, why isn't healthcare doing this? And the answer is, because it already is. And so this is anesthesia, so a, an exponential rise in the number of anesthetics given an exponential fall in the number of an anesthetic deaths over time. So, and by the way, that started in 1940, so healthcare could turn around to aviation and say, what kept, took you so long? We have made progress despite the fact that we work in a complex system where, that operates at the edge of chaos, which is demonstrably more complex and more unstable than almost any other industry that we are usually compared to. Uh, this paper is actually supposed to be a comparison of high and low income countries and mortality from anaesthetic and perioperative events, but it actually shows my point quite well. On the y-axis, it's logarithmic scale for more, uh, for uh, fatal events, and uh, the graph goes from 1940 all the way to the right. So it's a logarithmic scale because the, 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 the increases are so good, and you're seeing three, four, three or four magnitudes improvement in safety in terms of risk of death under anaesthetic or in the perioperative period. These graphs exist everywhere in medicine. This is maternal mortality. Now, I know that we've had real problems with maternal safety in this country, but you have to look at it in, in the run, and this is to Chris's earlier point, Chris Whitty's earlier point. Look at that. Now, the problem is, to err as human comes at that dotted line in 2000. And what we did was we said, well, what's been going wrong all this time, and why aren't we making any improvements? We spent very little time looking at this section, saying, what has gone right that has allowed us to do these things over this period of time? And I would put it to you that what we did there was not what we thought the airlines were doing. We didn't gain this massive, massive success in improved safety through behavioral modification. We bought it through system investment. And uh, this is just some of the things that we did, blood banking, antibiotics, uh, anesthetic advances, of course, better primary care, of course, better perinatal care. But you don't do these things by doing checklists alone. Checklists are useful, but behavioral modifications, by and large, 
are not the best way to buy this sort of advantage in these sorts of complex systems. So we need to get away, I think, from this narrative. We need to communicate better the complexity we face uh, and, and the things that we do. We need to recast our workforce for what they truly are, which is an asset rather than a vulnerability, overwhelmingly. Um, and I think that's important. The take-home messages as I come to an end of these. As we go forward in the next 25 years, maybe we should move away from the idea of to err as human, which sees the human in the loop, the frontline clinicians and managers as the vulnerability and a weakness to be found and identified, and rather celebrates them overwhelmingly as an asset that stop a system that's trying to tear itself apart every single day and stops it from tearing itself apart. That's how we should cast them. Isn't it interesting that with the recent Japanese Airlines crash at Haneda Airport, in which six people were killed because a Dash 9 rescue aircraft was on a part of the runway it shouldn't have been on and nearly took out both the aircraft, overwhelmingly the narrative was not, why the hell was that plane there? It is, as you see, look at what went right, look at how well trained we were, look at all the people we escorted to safety. I would put it to you, as people who worked in the NHS, who undertake 598 million consultations each year, each one with the potential for a risk to that patient, that you spend a lot of time escorting people to safety without anyone ever asking why that was good or any asking why you did it or how you did it or celebrating that fact. And we spend an awful lot of time concentrating on uh, the small number of cases uh, that, uh, uh, that go wrong. We work within a complex system. You manage, you manage that complex system and the risks associated by building better systems, and part of that is uh, done by listening to the people who populate the system, both the people who work within it and, of course, our patients. Uh, on the left there is Challenger, STS-51L, that exploded 73 seconds into flight in 1986. Columbia goes down in 2003. I worked at NASA at 2004 and went to all of the crash investigations. They, they talked to the crew. Uh, and the crews that survived, uh, and they were involved in the redesign of the vehicles to what they've got now, which is uh, the Artemis project. Shuttle had many phases of flight in which you could not rescue the crew if there was a catastrophic malfunction. In the first two minutes of launch, anyone who knew what they were looking at held their breath because if anything went wrong, everyone would die and there was nothing you could do. And the same was true in re-entry as they came through Mark 25. If the computer failed at that point, everyone would die. And indeed, in both cases, both those, those eventualities came to pass. When they redesigned the vehicle, they asked the people who rode the vehicle what they needed. This vehicle is not safe. I, I won't be surprised if we see a catastrophic failure of it in the next decade or so. But it is safer than its predecessor, and there is no phase in flight in which, theoretically, there is an escape option for that crew, because that is what the crew asked for. This is my final slide. 25 years on from To Err is Human, which characterised the people who work in the system as a principal vulnerability, we need to ask ourselves whether or not we are communicating this correctly and whether or not we need to recalibrate our understanding of risk. We talk about safety and we talk about healthcare being safe, but is that the right word to use? And that is my provocation today. Because if you say safe to somebody in the street, they think that roller coaster is safe, I would put my children on it. They think that flight to Terra Molinos is safe. I would fly on it with my family. When you say our healthcare is safe, you don't mean the same thing. We never do. And I don't think that's what I do, and I don't think for those of you who are clinicians, that's what you do. What we are involved in is the trade of risk. Someone comes to us with a large risk, um, and we, in return, offer through the procedure or the therapeutic intervention we have, a risk that is either smaller or more acceptable, and we trade. This is not safety. The goal may be to get to safety, but the journey is risk. And the sooner we have that conversation with ourselves, with our politicians, with our journalists, and we make everyone understand that, the better I think we'll be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Um, lots to think about there. And before we come to the audience, we've got two responses. Um, first, from Joe Rafferty about your experiences within your own um, trust, if you'd like to Thanks tell us much, about uh, those. Thanks uh, very Rebecca. That was really interesting, Kevin. And uh, I don't suppose I've looked at that error as human documentation for quite a long time, because it, 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 
we've absorbed some key messages out of it, but as you said, we haven't really taken a hard look um, at, at what it means for us. I found myself thinking, um, in the work that we've done, and I can sort of cover that, that we've stumbled across lots of the stuff you've talked about. One is, um, we, we have used a, a proposition, I'd say, around zero harm in a very particular way, um, and that has had upsides and downsides for us. Um, and there's no question that that created some sort of free song with staff that was both good and less good, I have to say. Um, and, but but, but our con my conclusion would be, um, through the process we've used, definitely what has emerged is the notion of staff as an asset. Um, so actually, they're, they're part of the solution, they're not part of the problem. Um, and I think, uh, however we do it, we have to find ways. There may be different individual ways and in specific trusts doing different things, but to out that, that particular uh, conclusion. I think it also made me think a lot about um, you know, the whole notion that we borrowed stuff from the aircraft industry and the nuclear industry and all other safety critical industries. And, you know, do, does it rule across easily? Not always. Is there something to learn? Nearly always, do you know? Um, but um, I, I think it made me think very much about do, do we need to be more um, a, sort of clear in healthcare that it's not homogeneous. The risks are different in different parts of what we do. So in a high ultra reliable system, I know you're, a, you're an ICU consultant, so, but there's a, there's a lot of reliability uh, in, in the processes. Um, <clears throat> in what the clinicians in my organization do is deal with an utterly complex and adaptive system in which the processes themselves, it's necessary to have the processes, but, but the risk actually is inherently in the patient, in the person. And the solutions are maybe a bit different. But, but I, 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 one thing I would say is I, I completely agree on the root cause analysis piece. We've spent, we spent so much time trying to get really good at root cause analysis just to conclude we may as well rip it up and throw it away. Um, we need to do quite a lot of different things. That's not to say that there aren't commonalities in lots of the investigations I looked at. I mean, um, you know, you could always see something that you thought, even though there was no root cause reported, you sort of run a ruler across five or six investigations and you think, well, I think we're stretching it a bit there. So, so the opportunity to lose, um, uh, to lose, uh, uh, you know, critical insight was, is very high, I think, if you believe that as a, as a sort of single approach. Um, uh, we, we, we set off at a, a, at a stage then when we, we talked about, particularly in our trust, zero deaths from inpatient suicide. That's probably the biggest, most catastrophic thing that happens in a healthcare setup. Hugely, hugely damaging, of course, for the, the, you know, the, the patient and their, their family and their relatives. But, but I don't like the phrase second victim, but, but you know what I mean when I say the impact of that on staff is absolutely shocking and terrible. And we started to think about the zero-based approach there because it's a very small number. Um, really, um, there's a lot that was amenable to change. So you could, you could work out what, if not perfect, at least what a heck of a lot better would look like. And there was a signal in, the, in my organization eight years ago when I used to say, well, tell me about how we benchmark on suicide rate. And the most common phrase I got back was, don't worry, we're, we're below the national average. I thought, well, well that's really interesting, but it wasn't the question I asked. The question I asked was, how many, what happens? You know, what are we doing? So, so I thought we had started to satisfy ourselves a little bit on uh, the sort of law of averages. Um, um, what we did was adopt zero inpatient death uh, by suicide. Um, and we never said that was a target. We've never ever said that that's a target. We said it's a proposition. It's a proposition that should unleash your clinical curiosity. It should, you shouldn't stop at a layer that when the balloon hits the ceiling, 
it's as high as it, you know you've reached you've reached the end of the journey we should push on beyond that that was really what we we, we posed and for the first few years actually it went really well there was a huge level of staff engagement uh, so it was a hooray moment for me but but actually in all of these things you've got three categories don't you you've got people who adopt and are enthusiastic for change and that was actually the people I was seeing. You've got the rump end of it, who no matter what you do, you're never going to impress those folks. And then you've got the contestable middle, the people who you, you can win if you get it right. Um, and after a couple of years, uh, I remember our uh, staff side uh, chief representative saying, look, we've got no problem with safer services. We're 100% behind that. Uh, and no problem with zero suicide in care. But what we, how about, I think the phrase was, how about zero blame? I said, well, what do you mean zero blame? Where we don't blame you, you know? We're not a blaming organization. They said, um, have you looked at your policies? And of course, when we looked at our policies, our policies were actually, I mean, we called them in the end policies that harmed mm -hmm. rather than policies that healed. So, so the policies in effect you know, after about two or three lines, almost sort of said, who was there and who was responsible? You know, um, and that is not A, close to a psychologically safe environment, and B, they were quite right. It was a, a blame culture. It wasn't a blame culture sanctioned by the board or senior leadership of the organization. I mean, I'll say that with my hand to my heart. But someone used the phrase earlier today, work as done versus work as imagined. And I, th I think we were classic uh, of an organisation that persuaded ourselves because all of the policies were there and they said all the right things. And we occasionally signalled, you know, that, that um, we were a safety-focused organisation. But somehow the policies, the processes, kept all of that safe and in place. And actually, what, um, what staff were saying was we need to shift from that rational component, which was Thea's point this morning, to a relational one. It was quite remarkable in a mental health trust that we'd forgotten about relationships, which is the core of what we do clinically every day. Um, so we, we didn't quite know what to do, but uh, I'd heard of a guy called Sidney Decker who proposed a model called restorative just culture. And uh, my uh, HR director, Amanda Oates, is, is one of those great sort of Liverpool women who just picked the phone up and harassed them to come <laughs> and work with us. Um, and so we started um, a programme of restorative just culture. Now, to be clear, I think lots of people talk about this, and I think we all talk about, maybe all of us talk about different things, or most of us talk about different things. So for the avoidance of doubt, um, we developed a restorative just and learning culture. That was our objective. So what is that? So I'm just going to read it out as we agreed it. A just culture accepts nobody's account as true or right and others wrong, particularly if it relates to your status in an organisation or team. Restorative just culture aims to repair trust and relationships damaged after an incident. So very much focusing on what we might call safety one. We need to get it to safety two and the what went right piece. Uh, but it allows all parties to, to discuss how they've been effective, affected and collaboratively decide what should be done to repair the harm. So that's a, a very clear definition uh, from our perspective. And we, we uh, contrast that with a retributive system. So, so quickly in retribution, and I think this is normally how it happens, um, we ask which rule, which rule is broken, who did it, how bad is the breach, and what should the consequences be? And often, I've, I mean, we've heard staff say, well, actually, how hard are you going to beat us in that respect? Terrible, terrible uh, situation. And it's hugely counterproductive. So uh, learning is suppressed. Uh, tameness, if that's a word, um, dissipates. Uh, humanity, compassion, forgiveness disappears. And it's worth reflecting, I said, I said it, Kevin. Uh, to err is human, but to forgive is divine. It's the other part of the quote. So, so finding forgiveness in what we do, understanding, restoration, healing, and trust. And those 
Restorative features have to apply to staff, but they also have to apply to bereaved parties or harmed parties. And I think when I heard Kevin talk about the dialogue around risk, it feels to me that after an event, the restoration piece at least helps context that risk. And if we do this in the right way, so-called safety to you know, celebrate what we do really, really well, then actually I think we could get to an incredibly good place around this. Um, do, so a few quick things. We have a few simple principles. Ask what, how, when, but don't ask who. You know, it, it's a core principle of what we do. And, you know, we always say a bad system will always beat a good person. And, and in the environment we're in at the minute, we need to switch the polarity on that. Um, in our system, it's not blame-free. Um, blame-free is as bad as fat, you know, full fat blame, or whatever the, <laughs> the description is. Um, in our system, accountability is prospective. So it's about the learning that you take into your future practice and a prospective view of accountability, as opposed to a retrospective view, which is what did you do wrong? And how can we write more rules? And usually the people who wrote the rules that didn't work in the first place write more rules. So we write it into policies. Um, uh, and really how punitive can we be in this sort, uh, sort of approach? Um, so I'll, I'll give you one quick example of when, when we started to implement this. And there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, detailed implementation which is on our websites and things like that. So we turned this into a set of practices because the great thing with Sydney when he when he, he, he waxed lyrical about it and we said how do you do it? He said well, I don't know. Um, you know it's, it's a theory to me um, and I think the worst thing we can do with stuff like this is, is theorize with their staff who really need solutions, who really need a framework to operate and work within. So, so we, we did a lot of that. And the same staff side person who said, how about no blame, said, I tell you what, I can't swear in here, I don't think, because it's live stream, but there was a swear word involved. <laughs> um, uh, but they said, I'll believe that this isn't chief executive bleep if you reduce the number of suspensions in the organization and reduce the number of disciplinary events that take place in the organization. And uh, over a period of uh, about three years, we saw um, a 71% uh, decrease in investigations in the organization and an 89% reduction in suspensions in the organization during a period when we carried out two acquisitions and trebled the size of Merseycare. Uh, which for me, they may not, I, I don't know if those are the, great, the best measures or not to have, but it was really important in switching staff from being antipathetical about this to actually wanting to engage and, and believe. And, and the, the swing has been huge, and ever since our staff side colleagues work really closely with us, not just on restorative just culture, but just about everything else as well because of whatever we built there. We also saw, incidentally, feeling safer at raising concerns. Um, that went from 67% to 83% uh, during the same time that we, we brought uh, well, well over 7,000 people uh, into the organization. So that's a sort of reflection that I think we've seen some benefits out of the zero stuff. But when I said we stumbled across stuff, I didn't realize that, and we did that sensitively, the zero-based stuff. I didn't think we'd harm staff um, or harm them more than we were already harming them. Um, so, so, I mean, that's been our story. I don't know how generalizable that is. Um, people say, can you do it for us? And we said, no, because you have to do it for yourself. But we've written lots of it up and codified as much of it as, as we can. Uh, and last thought for me is, you know, we've talked a lot about the need for change today and innovation and all sorts of things. And I'm struck by a quote, um, apparently on um, uh, the Tesla board, when someone said, no one comes up with a good idea while they've been chased by a tiger. 
Um, it sort of, sort of made sense to finish it on that. Except how to run away from a tiger. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really struck by the overlap between some of the ideas that we had in the productivity session this morning. And I was going to ask you, do you think it's affected your productivity? But the data that you've given it us sure at the end it. really tells us quite a lot about that. And so I should say one more thing. Yeah. It, we've, we save money doing this. I mean, we spend little bits here and there. But we save money because, you know, you reintroduce practitioners back into service. Yep. You know, suspensions run something like 18 months, you know, yep. um, and you're still having to pay for people to run services in that time. So I think there's a safety dividend in this that is both about the productivity gain, uh, but, but also it's cheaper to do it in this way. OK, so that's really good to hear. And I'm going to hold the um, question about generalizability and how one could expand this approach to other locations, but I hope it's a question that we can come back to because it feels very important. Um, Henrietta, over to you. Thank you for a, for a patient perspective on this. Yeah, thank you so much. And I've been reflecting about what we've been hearing today about productivity, about safety, about risk, about staff and well-being, a safety and learning culture, and how, as Thea so eloquently set it out this morning, this is all about relationships. And Baroness Cumberledge described the health service as slow, siloed, disjointed, dismissive, and lacking in compassion. And my role, which was a recommendation from her review, um, was to be the golden thread that binds together a disparate safety landscape. Although I have thought that there are so many golden threads in the health service, you could probably make a golden fleece out of them. Um, but like many of you here, my vision is for a transformed health service where we see patients as partners, where we have the right conversations and the right relationships, um, where leaders create that just and learning culture, just as you've heard from, um, from Joe, and, and in terms of the safety management system so that we can assess the system risk and, as, as a consequence, we can keep people safe, whether that's staff and patients. And I recently set out the priorities to the end of my term, um, focusing on restorative practice. By building better relationships up front, better conversations with patients and families, and better conversations with colleagues and regulators, with professional regulators, with officials, and with um, parliamentarians. Because I think that we need a restorative approach before harm occurs. We've been hearing about what can happen after an incident and how important it is to have those really good conversations. But I'd like to raise that ambition even further and think about, let's not put the fires out. Let's stop the fires happening in the first place. Because otherwise, you know, we, we re-traumatise patients and families through the adversarial complaint system, the clinical negligence, and even through investigations. Although I'm delighted that PSERF has involvement of patients as a key element of investigations. The other thing I would say is, in terms of slow, as Baroness Cumberledge set out, I've now learned that the cycle between me setting out a vision, which I did with Freedom to Speak Up, for leaders to have a responsibility in listening up and following up, it's got a seven-year cycle between me setting it out and it coming into NHS England guidance, as was published in a recent report. But I don't think we've got the time to wait years for this to come into place. And I think that everyone here in the room, certainly from the conversations and the questions that I've been hearing from the audience today, are impatient to see those improvements. I listened attentively to the Secretary of State's speech earlier today, and I listened out for the word safety. I didn't hear that word, but I think it's really important that leaders do talk about safety, as they do in high reliability industries, that leadership talk track is around safety and about a just and learning culture, because it needs to be everybody's business. So I would really encourage you, when you're thinking about your roles, how you're incorporating safety into your business as usual and not seen as the sort of technocratic uh, aspect dealt with specialists in a different department. In fact, chief execs, when um, I asked them what their you know, opportunity to talk about patient safety, told me that they talk about finance for about 40% of the time. 
and about patient safety for about 5% of the time. So I said, okay, well, I will turn that on its head. And they all laughed at me. But following feedback from a network of uh, NHS execs that I meet with regularly, they said that they want patient safety to be given the same priority as finance and operational performance. So today I've written to the NHS England Chief Exec Amanda Pritchard to request that patient safety is included in the forthcoming NHS England planning guidance as part of an overarching safety culture. Because we've heard today that working with patients as partners is how we're going to fix the NHS when we have conversations which invite change. And in the last few months, I've started seeing change happen, which I feel really optimistic about. From a conversation with the previous Secretary of State in September to recommendations about the successful implementation of Martha's Rule being on his desk in October, and then with the recent announcement of 100 NHS hospital sites uh, starting from April this year, I think we can start seeing change happening. Because I see this as preventative. The first step is asking patients, at least on a daily basis, who are in patients in specialist and acute trusts, how they're feeling. As was said earlier today, if we feel unwell, we should be trusted to know that. And in fact, it can anticipate deterioration in the new scores by 24 to 48 hours. Giving staff the opportunity to escalate their concerns in a psychologically safe environment where they know that they won't be victimised for raising those. That is also restorative practice. And then the third element is giving patients and families the opportunity to use those same escalation pathways. That is also restorative practice. It means that we can stop concerns turning into complaints. We can ensure that patients have the right information so that they can consent for their treatment. We want to actually stop harm from happening in the first place rather than always looking in the rear view mirror. Because if we can think about safety as a future event with quality planning and quality assurance and quality improvement as, as part of a safety management system, we can turn this into part of everyone's conversations. We can learn from other sectors. I don't doubt that there's a lot we can learn from construction and civil, civil aviation from um, even from NASA, but you know we can't just copy and paste it across. We're probably more akin in our risk profile to military aviation, and we can certainly learn in terms of the leadership and intent to create that just and learning culture. And I have to say, sitting here and hearing from Joe the experience um, in his organisation, I think we all know that it can be done, but we mustn't be victims of not invented here. So, so I've, I would like to set out a joint ambition where we have a future where we do work in partnership with patients, um, where we don't have a defensive or dismissive approach, either to patients who are raising concerns with us or to staff who want to speak up. But instead, if we could have a conversation with those who've been harmed so we, that we can understand their needs and understand who's responsible and what their obligations are, learn from what's happened and stop this from happening in the future. We can improve the safety and experience of our patients, their families and of our colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all the panellists. I'm, I'm going to open up to the floor, but just one quick question comes to mind. So you talked about Martha's Law having come through extraordinarily quickly, but that the general experience is of much slower cycles of change, six or seven years, and I think you've been working on it for, for that long. Um, Kevin, you talked about the, you know, the possible injury that we're doing to staff as a really acute problem around retention, and we're going to have a workforce session tomorrow. Have you got thoughts about what might fast-track this for staff, about how to get changes through more quickly? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, this is sort of sequel talk to the talk I gave last year. You know, the, the, the biggest problem facing us is workforce at the moment. Mm -hmm. You look at the retention figures, you look at their responses to the NHS staff survey, uh, you, you look at all of it. And I do think that we need to think deeply about what, what's the matter with medicine, not just in the UK, but across the entire high-income country uh, health services. 
There is mass epidemic burnout, retention problems, even in countries that you should think shouldn't have it, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. And, and you have to ask yourself what has changed, and I suspect part of it is the expectations that now exist are so high that I think the job is much harder to fulfil in a way that you think you are doing the right thing by yourself and your patients. So I think that this is part of it. So this is why I think that we need a better discussion about the risk in which we, in, we the environment in which we operate. So we absolutely can learn from other industries, absolutely that's true. But you cannot get those lessons out without doing due diligence and that takes huge effort. And we must acknowledge, and, and we know this at heart but we don't often quantify it, but what we do is vastly more complex and vastly more unstable than almost any other industry we compare it to, even military aviation. And, that, and that's mathematical truth. I can bore you over tea about Kolmogorov complexity and Lyapunov times. But basically, take it from me, we are definitely orders of magnitude more complex than almost any other industry we compare ourselves to. We should start having that conversation we should start recalibrating our expectations. We should start having honest discussions about the game that we're, the, 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 the endeavour that we're engaged in. And I think we all get to a better place. Okay, thank you. I'm, I've got one or two people in the audience primed to come in, but I'm going to take a few questions first. So, uh, gentleman there, and then the woman behind you. And I'll come to you. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yeah. All right. Uh, so, John Dean, uh, I'm Clinical Vice President of Royal College of Physicians. I'm a physician in East Lancashire. Um, I'd like to just um, explore this issue of risk a little bit more and how, uh, particularly from Kevin, you, you, you touched on in a complex system at transitions, and we know that risk is greater at transitions, and that the way that we behave as clinicians and with our patients at those transitions and whether we need to shift that at all. So I work predominantly in second, secondary care. We know the pressures that there are in the emergency system, which I, which I work in. We know that the pressures around uh, it, you know, discharging or transferring patients from hospitals and the risks associated with that. I have a fundamental belief that, in, certainly in secondary care, we don't share risk adequately with patients uh, or actually with our colleagues in community and primary care who arguably may be better at doing that because of, of the way they work. So how do we take a different attitude to sharing risks of either discharge or admission or treatments with patients at points of transition? I'm aware of some intermediate care settings where they introduced uh, risk-based, uh, shared decision-making around risk with patients in terms of them going home to what the healthcare staff saw as risky environments, but the patient said, actually, I really, that's where I want to live. I want to take a risk of falling down the stairs, if it, but, but I want to go home and they actually you know, reduce the length of stay by a third in doing that. So the question is, firstly, how can we... How should we and how can we better share risks around transition with patients? But secondly, and perhaps more contentiously, are patients and families prepared, and I believe they are, to look at whole systems risk to other patients as well? So that if I was to have a conversation with a patient on a ward that said, you know, I know you're concerned, you know, we're concerned about you going home, but actually there's a patient who's been waiting for a bed for the last 24 hours. Is there anything you and your family can do with me to help you to get home earlier so that patient come into hospital? I fundamentally believe that a large part of our society would respond to that. And yet I also fundamentally believe that as professions and as healthcare systems, we are scared to have that conversation because of the punitive approach that we often work in. So I'd just like your comments on tr the, risk at transition. Th th there's two parts to that. First of all, critical transitions, as I referred to it there, is a slightly different thing. Um, uh, what it refers to in a complex system is it's what I call the waterfall problem. So if you're trying to rescue someone who's on a boat on the river and you're chucking them the rope, are they on the river and it depends on how hard you chuck that rope or are they over the waterfall and it doesn't matter how hard you chuck that rope. That, that's the critical transition, the point of no return. And, and the problem is, in, in what we do, we're very often dealing in 
the point after that transition, and yet no one knows. And so when you make a mistake at that point, no one knows whether you contributed to this or not. But you're making a lot of decisions at that point. Well, I'll park that. Um, what you're talking about is those, those transitions in care, and I think it is coming back to this thing. So in engineering practice, they, they talk about trade space. They talk about the things that you can trade uh, 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 that are available to you to trade. For us as clinicians and to us as patients, risk is part of the trade space. And I think that if we're open and honest, and this is part of what I'm talking about here, is we're open and honest at every point about the trade of risk that <coughs> exists, that is part of consent. That is, that is part of what we do. And actually, with the NHS and the state that we're in at the minute, I think part of the answer is to understand that trade space and have everything in it. And that's how long it takes you to get something done, what enhanced risk or reduced risk you're willing to have in trade for whatever else that is cost, that is time to, to access whatever. So I think that using risk as a trade space and being open and honest with our patients about that, what they win and what they lose by making decisions about staying in or out of hospital in your particular point is part of the discussion. But the problem is, is and, and while absolutely safety should be our goal, the relentless pursuit of safety and absolute safety means you, effectively you're afraid to have those discussions and everyone becomes risk averse. And that is extraordinarily expensive. Before we move on to the woman behind, Henrietta, have, have you got thoughts on that and how patients might respond to those kinds of um, potential risk trades? Yeah, I would describe it as the what matters to me conversation because, you know, I've gone and visited patients at home, I'm a GP, and their, you know, circumstances are not one that if you put it on a risk form, you know, with local authority, you know, they wouldn't be, the, they can't be there. But I think this is about, this is about what matters to that individual person. And as a GP, we carry a significant amount of risk of people in the community. And I think part of this is about how, if we're all, if we're all looking after the same patients, how we can get benefit from having conversations with colleagues as well. So I was just going to say that it's, it's part of it is an organisational approach to how we manage risk, but it's also thinking about it very much from the perspective of an individual patient and their family. Can I just ask also what you think about that suggestion about effectively a societal trade, where you are asking people to be cognisant of the needs of the people in the corridor in A&E, of whom many may say yes, but you've probably got potentially a growing proportion who may say, mm -hmm. sorry, not my problem. What, what, how might that work? Because it's, it's an interesting challenge. I mean, you could put that into so many different contexts um, in terms of all sorts of trade-offs of, of uh, public sector um, spend. I think it's, it's quite a difficult ask to put onto mm -hmm. a person to say, there's somebody sicker than you, because people might look at it and say, that's your responsibility as an organisation. Yep. OK, thank you. Um, the woman behind, and then I think there were two people at the back, and then I'm going to come to Rosie. Thank you so much, all or three of you. That was fantastic, I think. I'm, I'm Julia Simon. I'm Director of Strategy and Partnerships, the Homerton Healthcare FT in, in North East London. I was, I was sort of pulled in different directions when you were talking. So on the one hand, I think, Kevin, you're redefinition of, of risk and also how we think about staff and it's so powerful and it feels so right and then Joe I've been following um, you know Mercer Care's work in this space and it's incredible what you've achieved as a cultural overhaul transformation so the counterpoint to that is and I'm sure this is true in most providers if not all that following Lucy Letby following um, various maternity reviews, my board has spent a lot of time talking about risk, risk appetite, uh, containment of risk, what can we do, and <coughs> so we have talked a lot about Martha's rule um, more recently. And the challenge from our NEDs is completely understandable, but it leans in that other direction, it doesn't lean in the direction of let's not ask who, let's just take this restorative approach. And I think if you're an exec on a board, when you have accountability that is not conceived in this way of projected into the future, but rather, you know, who the hell did the wrong thing, you know, and how do we prevent it from happening again? I think that strand in NHS culture is really strong and it's hard to 
to shift it without feeling like rel relinquishing your responsibility, you're not doing the right thing. And then on top of that, with the cost pressures, the clinical negligence scheme is such a big you know, part of a budget now for many trusts that it's hard to, if I want to go back to my trust and really take this lesson with me, how, what would your recommendation be to start addressing the, the challenge that I completely see from our NEDS is a rightful challenge, but to, to introduce this other way, which I think is much more productive for staff and ultimately for patients too. But how do we combine those different tensions? How do we resolve them? Henrietta first and then Kevin. So um, thank you so much. That's such a good point. And um, when I was a NED on a trust board, I did the, um, the non-execs uh, induction program. And we learned about finance, plot the dots, governance, a whole range of different things which are really important for being a non-exec. Not a single word about patient safety about the national patient safety strategy, about the patient safety syllabus, and about the direction of travel towards safety too, towards understanding and the involvement and not the pointing the finger of blame. So as part of my strategy, we've set out that non-exec directors should all receive training on patient safety. And we're working with um, national bodies to bring that in so that it's aligned with the, the, the NHS England strategy, but also other uh, safety organizations because I think we all need to be talking the same language so that we don't end up with people panicking when they're faced with an incident but they're able to actually see the direction of travel and the opportunities for learning and development for all staff. Kevin, do you want to comment? So, I mean, for everything I say, I'm very encouraged by what's happened. So I used to give a lecture about 20 years ago about what I thought should happen in healthcare safety, and Aidan Fowler's latest version of, of the National Patient Safety Strategy absolutely acknowledges its system much more than is individual, that, that we should be moving away fr from this concept of pejorative finding who is to blame. But the reason that we don't ask who is not because it's trying to be nice to the, to, to the member of staff, it's because it, in the context of the complexity that... I described, it's a useless question to ask. You can always thread a narrative that finds your kernel mustard with the candlestick wherever the hell they were. It's just a false narrative. It's just you seeing surface, or us seeing surface detail. And, and that, it's, it's really hard for us to accept that because we love, we love the story. But, but the truth is, is that the reason that we find clinicians overwhelmingly in that situation is because they're proximal to the patient when the patient dies. Mm -hmm. But, but for that to have happened, so many safety nets have to be, have been punched through along the way. There's a great song by Bob Dylan called The Ballad of Davy Moore. It's, 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 um, I think it's The Ballad of Davy Moore about a boxer who dies in the ring. It's a real boxer. And it's all about who killed him. And of course, it's the bloke who punched him. Or was it his promoter? Or was it the guys who sold tickets to the ring? Or was it the public who had an appetite to see boxing? And it is that. that is, it, all of this is The Ballad of Davy Moore. Just before we come to Joe, I want to ask people in the audience to try and think what would help you to introduce some of this if, in your organisations? What would enable you to do it? Um, so uh, it's not a real answer, Julia, to your question, but I suppose one of the things that if I reflect on, on my own journey on this, um, <clears throat> before we introduced restorative just culture and we looked at the outcomes of incidents and investigations in the Trust, well over 90% of them we ascribed to operator error or to an individual. Yeah? And then when, once we started to do this work, and, and actually then you begin to think a little bit more about the types of things Kevin has talked about, cause and causation and consequence and all of those things, um, when we really took a hard look at the same set of incidents, it was really clear that about 90% of the issues were about systematic beyond the, 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 the patient clinician um, encounter. And when I last looked, um, the definition that I carry around in my job of uh, accountable officer, um, well, it sort of points back to me and to the board. And I think it's really, I mean, that for us was a big turning point when, when we said most of this stuff is our accountability. And in executing our accountability, we make it possible for the front line to do stuff in a way that, you know, they're, they're able to work in, in a very effective way. So, so I think there's something about just pressing on that point 
and maybe doing an exercise with, or getting somebody to do that exercise, because it, it, it made me uh, realize, actually, uh, I, was, I was trying to hold people to account for stuff that I was accountable for. How sarcastic is that, do you know? Um, uh, and I think the other just reflection that needs to be made in this, we, we talk a lot about the need to learn. It's not the learning that's the hard, but it's the unlearning is the really, really hard bit. Because boards have never done anything really different, I have to say. So to, to get boards to unlearn is actually the, the really big challenge, I think. Okay. We have Rosie Bennyworth in the audience, who is um, the interim um, chief inspector at the health services safety investigation body and I, I'd ask um, Rosie just to give us some reflections she's also um, spent time previously at CQC on what you think would help to give us a new way of thinking about risk Yes, thank you. So um, I'm the interim chief executive of the new kind of ALB on the block, which we went live on the 1st of October. And um, I've just got some thoughts and comments uh, based on this really great discussion that we're having this afternoon. Um, I agree completely aviation and the other industries are nothing like health. Health is much more um, complex, but I have spent quite a lot of time with some of those other safety critical industries. And I think there are some things we can learn. Firstly, um, they have clear safety management systems with clear accountability as to who's responsible for safety and who's accountable for safety. If you look at someone's patient's journey across health and care, no one is actually accountable for a whole person's journey across the health and care system because it's fragmented. So that's my first challenge. How do we make sure that we're clear about who's, who's um, accountable for safety? Um, secondly, we've talked a lot about digital and AI today. And actually, I see a lot of incidents where um, things have gone wrong around interoperability, data sharing, uh, AI. We have not AI yet, actually, but I'm sure that will probably cross my path at some stage. And what I would say is that if you look at the London Underground, when they're designing new systems, they have people with human factors expertise in there right from day one designing those new systems. I would ask all of us here, we all know how important innovation and transformation is going to be. How many of us have actually got those people with that expertise in right from day one who are saying actually have you thought about how we're going to put this in place because actually what we see is not the technology it's not the innovation it's not the bit of kit that is you know very shiny and lovely it's the real-time user testing it's the fact that actually no one's thought about how it's going to work in those local environments and so um, I think a, a practical thing we could do is think about how do we really expand that kind of human factors expertise um, and uh, uh, and think about that kind of uh, the fact that we are all human and the third thing is just to say I was delighted to hear the kind of uh, thoughts about root cause analysis if you want to kind of have a two-minute read of something we've just done a interim report about retained swabs which follows a, a very sad case of a lady who went to have heart surgery and then uh, came back to ITU, was found to have a retained swab, went back into theatre to have it removed, went back to ITU and then was found to have another retained swab which was hiding and I had to go back to theatre again and um, and actually we looked at 31 incident reports around the country of, of, of investigations that had happened and we know with the hierarchy of intervention effectiveness actually when you look at the people interventions which are things like training and education and um, policies and those things they're not particularly effective interventions compared to things like the forcing function so locking stuff up and changing your systems and standardization and actually, when you looked at those 31 reports, 24 of them had training and education as the kind of top recommendation. Um, the second recommendation was tell people to adhere to the policy. And then we wonder why um, things keep happening again and again. So I think this move to PSERF is brilliant and this move to kind of really thinking about the systems that we're working in rather than the staff is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. So, um, is anybody willing to rise to my challenge and, and say what you think would really help? We have heard some, some ideas there and from the panel, but what else would help people in their organisations to take on and, and introduce this kind of thing if you've got a bit of an obstructive board? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, Ron Agblay, Rule Free London. Um, so I'll have a hazard of a guess that I think human stories are really powerful in these situations. So how about a staff story um, about an incident in a particular location? 
uh, and how it's been investigated and what people have learned. Because I think that element is really memorable and really impactful. So that might be a way to go with this because we've seen that in other contexts, um, patient stories, um, human stories have really hit home. So that, that might be part of the way through this. But um, I, I really like Julia's um, question because she's challenged us because there's an element of we can come to a day like this which is incredibly energizing and we hear lots of really good talks, but you can kind of get, this is a little bit of a bubble. Um, I really like it, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but we get back to our organizations and it can seem very, very far away because I know we've got quality committee in a couple of weeks time. Uh, there will be something we hear about um, that will make us feel um, uh, very highly motivated to make sure that that thing doesn't happen again. And, and that's where, as you put it, I mean, it's not quite a who done it, but simple explanations of, oh, right, well, we just need to get those staff trained or find that person or make sure that that thing can't possibly happen again. So it can be really reinforcing. So I think it needs rather powerful forces, as you put it, um, uh, Professor Rafferty, to unlearn. Uh, yeah, I, th I think stories are extremely important. I think as long as we embrace the full complexity of those stories. Now, I, th I think also the point about human facts, absolutely. I mean, A, the creation of HSSIB, I think, was a huge step forwards for us in this country. Um, human factors, I think, is brilliant as long as we don't misunderstand it. And I so often see it misunderstood, as I'm sure you do, Rosie, as factors of humans. So as medics, we love the idea that we're basically elite sportsmen and women, and, and it's all about our human performance. And we conflate human factors with human performance, factors of humans. Human factors and ergonomics, if you, know, you want to use that title. The way that the human interfaces with the system. Building a system which makes it hard to do the wrong thing and easy to do the right thing is the way forwards. And that is not something that you can invent out of your medical school 101 course. You need to have paid professionals embedded. In the next 25 years, those people should be part of our teams as much as, much as anybody else in our workforce. We don't have that. And so our effector arm is lacking. We need humans, factors, and ergonomics professionals embedded within our teams, designing our processes as we go forward. Thank you. We've got about seven minutes left. I've, got, I've seen three other hands up. So um, one right at the back, Matthew, right at the back. And um, then I'll, I'll come to you and then Nick. Can you keep your comments relatively brief? Because we haven't got that much longer. Thanks. <laughs> well, say it very quickly then. I, I talk re I'll talk really, really quickly. Yeah. So, um, I, I just, um, I think when, you, when we talk about risk and when we talk about the regulation of risk, it often feels to leaders like it's an inhibitor on innovation. And I guess this is a question for, for, for Kevin actually that can a conversation about risk be better used as a way of enabling system change, the kind of system changes we need? So. I think an example would be the winter before last, where there was a kind of recognition that the biggest risk that existed in terms of urgent emergency care was, uh, was, hospital, was ambulance response times, which led to different practices, North Bristol model, whatever. So there was a consensus that that's where the biggest risk lied, and that lay, and that led to a change of practice. And that risk, that kind of risk trading conversation, now whether or not that is the right thing to do, we can debate, but it was interesting because it led to a change of policy based upon an understanding of where risk lay. But we don't do that in other examples. So, you know, if you, anyone who's been in a hospital on a day of a junior doctor strike, know that hospitals are quite happy places often on those days because, you know, the consultants are, are, are in the wards or in A&E and fewer admissions are being made because there are people who are less risk averse. But of course, when an admission is made by someone who is being risk averse and that person then gets stuck in the hospital for 15 or 20 days, that has huge effects in terms of risks further down the line. But that, that risk trade needs to be explored. Or you could go to Chris Whitty's presentation and the, the risk trade that is involved in intensive interventions in the very, very end of people's lives, which draws resources away from other parts of health uh, healthcare that they could be placed in. So I guess my question is, how do you turn the conversation about risk from one that feels like it, in a sense, inhibits innovation and change and actually say a conversation about risk and risk trading can be a driver of some of the bigger shifts that we need to see? Gosh, it's, it's really tricky, that. So the truth is that we're doing it every day, aren't we? We're trading 
risk every day. I do it every day on my emergency list. I know that if I have a 90-year-old patient who scores so high on the Nottingham score, they should go to HDU, and I trade that risk to keep the system flowing and to get that patient there operation. I usually talk to the patient about it. Uh, and mostly we, squ we squash that risk trade down to the patient and the individual clinician, as is probably appropriate. When you have an entire system that is operating hot, as we did during COVID, there is the question of who should own that risk. Should there be a corporate ownership of that risk? And Steve's sitting in the front of the audience. I don't, <laughs> I don't, don't want to put too much... But, but, it, but it is very tricky because I think there comes a point where you have to reset your entire thresholds, but that's very difficult difficult legally, medico-legally, philosophically, etc. And finally, I, I do agree, I don't think that we can put upon a single patient the needs of all the other patients in the system. The relationship is between you and your patients. So, so you know, it, it, it's a very tricky thing. In truth, we're doing this all the time and we're accepting that at individual level. Is that right? I think it is as long as we've got cover, top cover for those decisions in that context. I'm, I'm never entirely clear that we do. Um, we've got four, four minutes left, so can I just have very brief comments? First from Simon and then Nick. Uh, so the one mic in the middle here. Steve. Steve. Oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> Do you want to come down here briefly? Uh, well, I was just, uh, Steve Powers, National Medical Director. I was just going to comment on the last comment about spreading risk across the UEC pathway because I think that's a really good example. And, and when we first thought, started talking about it for the reasons you said on our concern that the highest level of risk was the, was the citizen to whom the ambulance couldn't get to in time, uh, probably about 18 months ago now, maybe a bit longer. Uh, and, and it's been a really interesting journey of seeing uh, how people's perception of how that risk is handled it has changed. And I, I've been to lots of emergency departments and lots of hospitals and talked and talk to staff about this over the last year and a bit. And, and definitely it has changed from last winter where people were having, were struggling with the concept through to this winter where, where it is much more about how you implement that risk spreading rather than having difficulty getting your head around the concept. And, you know, the North Bristol model is one, but everywhere has implemented some sort of uh, variety of it. Uh, and I, th I think what, what it, it, so my observation, it's been a cultural shift. Uh, and sometimes it has been individual clinical leaders or operational leaders who've said, actually, we're going to have to make the change because the risk has become too great in one part of this pathway. It's, it's usually forced a whole system response. So, it, in it, so just making that shift has then pulled in the rest of the hospital, it's pulled in the rest of the, the, the pathway. Uh, and so thinking about that risk differently has had a, has had a positive impact on, on the whole pathway, not just the one bit of the pathway that might have been, it might have been the ED, it might have been somewhere else that's made this change. Um, but I think it has opened the doorway to having a conversation about how we think about collective risk and how we, although you're absolutely right, Kevin, as clinicians, our responsibility is always first and foremost to the patient in front of us. We also increasingly have that wider responsibility to groups of patients and patients that we're not directly looking, at, looking after. And I think we need to think in the medical profession and also in the other professions, not just medical profession, about how we introduce people to that sort of concept of thinking about risk. Um, and how we think about that population-based approach increasingly, because that is what we will be doing in the future. Uh, and it is a bit of a shift away from what we've done in the past. But I'm quite positive. And on, on the cover, it is the reason that I, with Chris, and, and with, with Charlie at the CQC, uh, so I see GMC sitting behind me, and, he, and the CQC have written out pretty much every winter <laughs> since the pandemic to say that we have your backs on this. We understand that you are, as professionals, because because our clinicians worry about their professional regulators, our organizations worry about our CQC, the CQC is regulated. And, and we are all aligned on this. We understand that this risk has to be managed. So we will do whatever we can to provide people with cover, and we're quite clear about that. Thank you. I'm afraid that does mean that we've run out of time, so I can't come to the other questions. Um, there's a, there's a, I mean, I, 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 there's, there's so much that could be said. I think just trying to sum up a few points, um, Rosie's challenge to design systems well, to get the right people with the right expertise to design systems from the, from the get-go. 
the challenge about rethinking our governance so that there's almost a kind of parity of esteem, perhaps, between the safety issues and the financial issues and that you have a, a, a quality, uh, a balanced scorecard where safety features m more highly than it does now and is given more attention. Um, but I think one of the things that I've been really struck about is when we, when we first talked about this um, session, we talked about the risk trade-offs between clinicians and patients, and that's led us into a lot of reflections on the conversations that could be had and that could be had prospectively. But so much of the comments that have been made are about the systems and the way that the system um, are designed and structured and how that affects risk. So um, there's clearly a balance to be achieved between those two perspectives. Um, so much more that we could have said. Time has run out. Um, Thea is, th sorry, just before Thea does come up, can I ask you to join me in thanking our panel for all their thoughts? <laughs>